Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Leah Watts and I'm the Health Professional Education Opioid Use and Opioid Use Disorder Project Manager. I would first like to acknowledge that the Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing's national office is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. This is the third webinar of a series that are part of this project on opioid use and opioid use disorder funded by Health Canada. Today you will hear a bit about the project and the recently launched e-resource which is open access and available to you. We are pleased to welcome two guest speakers who will provide you with different perspectives on opioid use and chronic pain. We hope that throughout this next hour and a half, you will discover a new resource that will be helpful to you in your practice or education setting and provide you with an opportunity to learn from subject matter experts. At the end of the speaker's presentations, we will have time for questions, so please put your questions in the Q&A box. Our first speaker is Dr. Cynthia Baker, who is the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing. Cynthia will provide you with an overview on the project. Please go ahead, Cynthia. Oh, I think you're muted. Okay. My apologies. So uh, in 2018, the Association of Faculties of Pharmacy of Canada, the Canadian Association of Social Work Education, and the Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing started this project with, sun with funding support from Health Canada. Our organizations committed to working together to collaboratively foster curricular change in education programs for registered nurses, pharmacists, and social workers across Canada. The goal of the project is to ensure that health and social service providers enter the workforce well-equipped with relevant evidence-informed knowledge to address issues related to opioid use and opioid use disorder. This is across the prevention, health promotion, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery continuums at primary, secondary, and tertiary care levels. To achieve this goal, uh, the project has developed a series of outputs. The first was interprofessional educational guidelines related to opioid use and opioid use disorder. The goals of the guideline uh, is to, or the goal of the guidelines is to promote and guide curricular change in Canadian schools, faculties of nursing, pharmacies, and social work. The education guidelines were completed in early 2020 and are available online. The second output was to develop protocols that address selected areas within the educational guidelines that will facilitate integration into member schools. Uh, to date, uh, a protocol on stigma and naloxone are available. The third and most extensive output is uh, an electronic resource for faculty and students in entry-level nursing, pharmacy, and social work programs. The e-resource provides our programs with information, teaching, and learning materials, and tools related to the education guidelines. It provides greater and more in-depth content to foster the integration of the interprofessional guidelines into the curricula of member schools. It also includes a section on lived experiences. Currently, the guidelines are also available in French with the French e-resource and protocols being launched by the end of the month. The e-resource was linked uh, for you in the webinar welcome email, includes a wealth of knowledge developed by numerous experts in opioid use and opioid use disorder, across pharmacy, nursing, and social work. The unique interprofessional aspect to the project and this resource makes it usable across a wide spectrum of health and social service providers. I hope that following this webinar, which will include a presentation on the content development, as well as some guest speakers on key topics within the area of opioid use and opioid use disorder, you will spend some time looking through the resource and consider how you can use it in your courses. We also hope you will provide the project team with some feedback in a short survey, which we will be sending to you following the webinar. To wrap up, uh, I would like to thank Health Canada for their funding. If you have any further questions about the project, please email Leo Watts at Kazan. That's lwatts at kazan.ca. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Beasley. Dr. Beasley was co-lead with Dr. Fang Cheng on the content development for the e-resource. Dr. Beasley is an associate professor at the School of Pharmacy at the University of Waterloo. Oh, one second. His clinical and education research is focused on the role of health professionals in reducing harms associated with problematic substance use. Dr. Beasley will provide you with an overview of the content development process. Please go ahead. Sure, thanks. Can you see uh, my slides? Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, I'll just take a little bit of the time right off the bat to give you a, a brief snapshot of how the content for the the e-modules was created. Um, so who who we were, uh, the team that that put it together, how we went about it, <clears throat> take a little bit of a bird's eye view of the content and discuss how we addressed issues around language, breadth, and depth of the content and, and give you an example of how I used some of these modules in my course. Um, so as Leah said, I'm uh, Michael Baisley. I'm at the University of Waterloo in the School of Pharmacy and uh, was kind of the co-lead in, in taking on the content creation with my colleague, Fen Chang, who's also at Waterloo. Um, and we brought in uh, Colleen McMillan, who works at the School of Social Work at, the Re at Renison University College as well as Professor Shelley Walkerly, who teaches in the nursing program at York University. Uh, we had extensive support, <coughs> excuse me, from our project coordinator, uh, Huda Shah, Rosemary Colleen, who's also at the School of Pharmacy at, at Waterloo. She's, she does a lot of continuing education for uh, practice, uh, practitioners, but um, has a wealth of knowledge about online learning modules. And the Center for Extended Learning not only created the online content, but also guided us every step of the way as we were um, putting it together and thinking ahead of, of and anticipating roadblocks. And we couldn't have done it without um, their extensive support. Um, so um, once the advisory group came up with their learning objectives, uh, the grand total ended up being eight learning objectives with about six to 12 topics with, within each. So there was a total of 65 topics. So there's 65 um, online modules. Uh, we went about assigning these 65 to a primary content creator and a second reader, sought external expertise um, for gaps in content when necessary and went through an extensive review process, both internally within our team, uh, but also with the management committee and the advisory committee and uh, stakeholders that were brought in to provide feedback. So you've been sent uh, uh, links to the modules, but I just wanted to talk about what was covered. Um, we start off with some facts and figures, looking at the epidemiology of opioid use, a module on continuum of care and resources, um, module about screening, assessment, intervention, follow-up, a module about trusting, compassionate, and therapeutic relationships, one on trauma, violence, and cultural safety, one on opioid use education, not just for the pace, patient or the person, but also their supports, communities, and decision makers, and a module on pain management, and one on harm reduction. So obviously we won't go through everything, but I'll just give you a few snapshots of what this actually looks like. Looks like. So if you go to module one, topic G is um, basically what types of opioids are being used clinically, uh, as well as what types of unregulated opioids are present in Canada. So each, each topic starts off, off with some learning objectives. Um, there's a key concept point right off the bat, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so you can sort of get the take home messages. Uh, and this is just a, one of the, the bits of text in the, in the module, uh, and specifically in this case about which unregulated opioids, fentanyls and their analogs have been detected in the, the unregulated market in North America. At the end of each module, we'll have three to five questions. They're typically multiple choice questions, but there's other formats as well, including some reflection questions. So throughout the modules, we, we endeavor to use non-stigmatizing language wherever possible, and also to balance language and terminology used 
uh, within the three professions because um, pharmacy, nursing, and social work don't always necessarily agree when it comes to language and 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 what we're uh, you know who we're talking about. So in pharmacy, we we use the term patient all the time. Um, uh, that's common in, in nursing as well, and, and less so in social work, where you're using a person, person you're working with, individual, and, and other terminologies. Because there is some variability depending on sort of where the content is coming from and where external resources are being pulled into, we did include a glossary uh, in, the, in the, the resource, as well as some examples of where different terminology is used. As mentioned, the target audience uh, for these modules are, are undergraduate students in social work, nursing, and pharmacy programs, although uh, we anticipate that others may use the resource as well. And so not only right off the bat is this an interprofessional uh, endeavor where we have students with very varying backgrounds um, coming into contact with these modules across the three professions, we also haven't really dictated where these modules might fit into a particular curriculum. So uh, we could envision modules being used in the first week of the first term of a program or uh, for much more experienced students. So we tried to balance the breadth and depth of the content um, across uh, an undergraduate program and across the professions so that these modules are, are useful, but not so dense that they're um, not really accessible to, to one or more of the groups. Most modules ended up being about 1,000 to 2,000 words. I'll just give you an example. So there's 65 topics. Obviously, that's a lot to do all at once. We didn't necessarily envision that uh, an educator would assign uh, the, all 65 uh, topics. We felt that it's much more likely that they will be assigned a la carte. And so we did reproduce some key uh, content across several modules and topics. And so I, I um, taught a, a first year pharmacy pharmacology course this summer. Um, and one of the um, topics I wanted to introduce was uh, substance use. And so how I used the modules were, was I went to module one and assigned five topics to give the students a sense of what opioids are, how they're used, who's using them, and so forth in Canada. Um, I chose topic A from module four because I wanted to introduce right off the bat the idea of bias and particularly implicit bias. So I, I chose that module. And then I chose three topics in module seven and eight to introduce um, uh, briefly the concepts of pain management. They're not gonna do pain management until they're start of their third year, but I wanted to get the ball rolling for them and some introductory topics about harm reduction. So I'll hold off questions for now and, and we can, if you have any questions for me, we'll come back at the end um, and I can address them then. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Mike. Our first guest speaker is Dr. Laura Murphy. Dr. Murphy is a pharmacist clinical leader at Toronto Rehab and clinician investigator with the Kite Research Institute at the University Health Network in Toronto. Her clinical practice and research are focused in chronic pain. Dr. Murphy lectures and precepts at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto, is co-chair of the Interfaculty Pain Curriculum Committee at the University of Toronto Centre for the Study of Pain, and a member of the National Faculty on the Use of Opioids in Chronic Non-Cancer Pain. Please go ahead, Laura. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Get into presenter mode and I'll get started. So in addition to the hats that I wear that was already described, my clinical role is in a chronic pain clinic where I work uh, very interprofessionally and sometimes transprofessionally with um, uh, a variety of, of other uh, healthcare providers, physiatrists, um, uh, family physicians. I work with nurses, nurse practitioners, OTs, PTs. Um, so we're really lucky in that clinic. 
And we really see opioids as an interprofessional responsibility, but certainly one where I focus a lot of my practice. So um, I hope to share some of that knowledge and a case with you today. So I have no financial or personal relationships to disclose related to the content of this um, uh, uh, webinar. And I just wanted to start with a pop quiz, just a, a, a self-test. I don't have any fancy tech here today. Um, so from your perspective, what percentage of Canadians currently experience chronic non-cancer pain? And you can actually feel free to type in the chat um, if you'd like to share that info. I think I may have a hard time seeing the chat just with my screen set up, um, but I will share that. Let's see. Okay, so we have someone who shared it was 20% and that's absolutely right. I'm sorry to report that, um, that almost one in five Canadians currently experience chronic pain. Um, so we know that this is uh, impacting disproportionately populations of women, children, Indigenous people, older adults, veterans, and people who use drugs. Uh, these populations are more likely to experience social inequities and discrimination, which certainly influence how pain is experienced. These impacts of unmanaged pain, which includes sleeplessness, fear, depression, isolation, a diminished quality of life, poverty, homelessness, and even suicide have not really been addressed or explored much in the literature. But we know um, based on uh, stories from our patients that these are, are highly prevalent. Um, we also know that adverse childhood experiences and trauma worsen the experience of pain. And so as healthcare professionals, when we approach uh, partnering with people to support them in the management of their pain, we know that there um, are many other kind of um, issues that we really need to either refer them for further therapy or help them work through that are connected closely to their pain. And this brings us to our approach in terms of how we manage pain. Um, the biopsychosocial model of pain views pain as this multidimensional and dynamic interaction between biological and psychological and social factors that reciprocally, um, that reciprocally um, influence each other. And uh, so our approach really needs to address all of those factors. Um, the three P's are typically used, but with our patients, we use the three M's um, because they're much uh, more approachable language. So um, looking at modalities that impact mind, movement and medication. We even go beyond the mind movement medication realm, um, certainly as to be culturally responsive to also include self-management, pain education, uh, spiritual approaches, really thinking of what's going to work best for this person to help cope with their pain. Um, pain education and self-management is evidence informed. Uh, studies have really shown that teaching patients about neurophysiology and neurobiology of pain reduces pain, catastrophizing, and healthcare utilization, and ultimately improves function. So that's really at the core of a lot of our approach. Other psychological or mood approaches include CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and uh, acceptance and commitment therapy. Physical approaches, which I often... Um, link with my interprofessional colleagues to make recommendations about include exercise, but also rest, stretching, ice, heat. Um, so whoops. Uh, we really want to ensure that those are also foundational um, in terms of movement in their care plan. And um, finally, pharmacological strategies um, or medication are, is an area where I really focus. Um, and we'll go to our medication options. So there are many guidelines that exist for the different types of chronic pain that people experience or the different diagnoses associated with their chronic pain. Certainly there's um, more or less evidence depending on that diagnosis for some of um, uh, these medication options over others. Um, we often look for um, 
opioid sparing uh, alternatives, really, when we look at the risk benefit for a lot of these, but we can see that opioids um, do exist as an important tool as part of all of the medication options, but there are many others that should be explored and optimized. And so we try and take a stepwise approach depending on the person's diagnosis, uh, past experience, um, history, uh, trialing some of these medications to really find the right individualized plan for them. So opioids have some benefits and although the evidence doesn't necessarily point to a lot of functional benefit, certainly they can improve uh, the quality of some patients' lives. Um, you know, we've seen that some people, the benefits do outweigh the risk because they support them to do the things they enjoy. Um, but we always need to take a, a careful look at what risks are impacting people. Certainly this list is long, um, but we start with the very common things like constipation, which may never go away and can um, be so severe that it can lead to things like bowel impaction. Um, and then of course, nausea and vomiting, which certainly can impact people's day to day. And then longer term effects also present after people have used opioids long term, things like immunosuppression, um, which of course has been very recently something that uh, we often discuss with our patients who are on high dose long term opioids in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they also may experience hypogonadism, falls and fractures, and opioid induced hyperalgesia, which I know um, one of the panelists today will do a deeper dive into, but essentially it's a paradoxical effect of opioids where instead of managing pain, they actually lead to worse and more widespread pain. Opioids also can cause withdrawal. If they are stopped abruptly, people actually um, experience this often as if they miss a dose. And so they may experience worsened pain um, sleep disturbance, flu-like symptoms, um, and they, you know, if it gets quite severe, they say it's something that's the worst they've ever experienced in their whole lives. Even if people do not stop their opioids, um, I've had many of my patients describe to me these withdrawal symptoms between their doses, you know, close to the time of their next dose, or even when they experience an incremental decrease in the amount of opioid in their body. And for our patients who are on this long-term, this can actually lead to um, a really vicious cycle of experiencing withdrawal between doses, taking that next dose, feeling a little bit better. And so they often attribute um, more benefit to the opioids they're using because they feel like it's providing them this relief, but actually it's causing some of the issues because it's actually creating some of this withdrawal. Um, there is also the significant risk of overdose, both fatal and non-fatal overdose, um, as well as the risk of opioid use disorder, which um, I think, you know, there's many concerns about because of the media, uh, because of patient experiences, because, um, you know, these stories are often repeated, um, related to a lot of fear. Um, we know that approximately 8% of people who are using opioids therapeutically may um, go on to develop an opioid use disorder. Um, so depending on your context, you know, that might be higher or lower than you might expect. I'm just going to back up a few slides. Sorry, it's a little bit out of order. And I wanted to introduce to you um, one of... Um, a uh, patient that I've been following for many years long term, or it's based on um, her case. And she's given me permission to do so. So this is Cassandra. She's 39 years old. Um, she was diagnosed with sickle cell disorder when she was two. And she's really had pain her whole life. She's had acute pain episodes, and now long term chronic pain, which is mostly musculoskeletal. She has it in her hips, her low back and her shoulders. And she always tells me her pain comes on like a heaviness, um, something that she can't really escape. Um, when I first met her, she was also using a very high dose of opioids. She was on a high dose of fentanyl patch. And also um, she used short acting morphine for breakthrough. Um, you know, her doses went up and down to manage her acute pain episodes, but her baseline was also very, very high. Uh, her mood was really low, her sleep was poor, she was off work, and she really felt like her pain management was out of control, 
but the only solution that was ever proposed to her was continuing to increase that dose. Um, you know, she always described to me uh, feeling a lot of judgment from her coworkers, her family, her friends, even some of her healthcare providers, and particularly, um, unfortunately, when she went to the emergency department for her acute pain episodes, she often felt like that. Um, but also when she, you know, tried to improve her pain management, she also heard that she would have to be on these medications forever. So she really was experiencing a lot of hopelessness. So I just wanted to set that scene as we kind of talk about opioid use in Canada. I'm sorry for, for um, screaming through some of these slides. Um, so this brings us to a uh, pop quiz or really uh, a self-reflection question number two. So where do you feel that Canada would currently rank in the world in terms of opioid consumption per capita? If anyone has any idea, you can feel free to type that in the chat. I figured out now how to view the chat. Thank you so much for some of the brave participants who are putting forward some numbers. Okay, excellent. So uh, the guesses that I saw or the, the knowledge that I, I saw were that we ranked either second or fourth. And this is a bit of a tricky question because for many years we did rank second in the world out of hundreds and hundreds of countries, um, meaning that we were uh, quite high in terms of opioid consumption per capita. Fortunately, um, we have dipped down, as you can see in this graph, um, where we rose to number two from 2007 uh, onwards all the way up until about 2017. There's some overlapping data periods there. But finally, we're starting to see a reduction in prescribed opioids in Canada per capita, and we're down to fourth. So the correct answer for my uh, question was, was um, fourth in the world. Although that shows some improvement, certainly we still need to remember that that is quite high. You know, being top five or top 10 in the world means that we potentially have a long way to go learning from other countries in terms of pain management. Um, you know, I think bringing it home to um, uh, people in, living in Canada, we, in 2018, um, Kaya High has some data that one in eight people were prescribed opioids, so that's still quite a lot. And of those people, one out of every four um, had a previous non-opioid prescription for pain relief prior to starting opioid therapy. So what this tells us is that many people, um, so one in four, um, sorry, only one in four are trialing other therapies before moving to opioids for pain relief. And so I think that that, uh, you know, moving back to that menu of options, um, we can do better um, in terms of use of opioids. Now, part of this reduction um, in opioid prescribing was as a result of um, actions to address the unfortunate opioid crisis that is ongoing uh, in North America, certainly, and really moving to an international opioid epidemic related to opioid-related deaths that we've seen in Canada early on um, that was closely linked to um, prescribed opioids. But we know now that that's moving um, more in the direction of non-prescription or, or fentanyl. Um, linked with a lot of those deaths. Um, some of the um, actions that were to address the opioid crisis included the release of the 2017 Canadian Opioid Guideline. And I'm not gonna walk through this guideline in depth here, um, but I provided the reference in the CMAJ that describes it. Um, but certainly there were many recommendations made out of these guidelines that were evidence informed. Um, they used a system where they labeled them as strong or weak recommendations. And I'll just draw your attention down to the bottom right, because one of the uh, 
most discussed uh, recommendations that came out were that for patients using a high dose, so a morphine equivalent dose of 90 milligrams or more, tapering to the lowest effective dose or discontinuation was recommended to be considered. Now, as a result of this recommendation in particular, but other recommendations in the guideline as well, unfortunately, we have seen unintended consequences for people living with pain. Um, I think that these titles of these journal articles, which were incredibly well done, and if you're interested in learning more, I would direct you to reading them, um, they really are descriptive. There was a qualitative study that really uncovered that people who take opioids were impacted significantly by a lot of the um, policy changes. Um, they really experienced um, uh, a loss of autonomy. Um, sometimes a lot of changes were made to their medication, even though they, they were not ready for those changes. Um, and it caused actually worsened health outcomes for them. Um, and we know that one of those worsened health outcomes was linked with rapid tapers that occurred close to that kind of threshold dose that was established as 90 milligrams, even though it was unintended um, in the language of the guideline. And so this article actually points to the fact that there were significant changes um, uh, in policy as a result of that recommendation, which led to poor outcomes for patients, unfortunately. And then layered on top of that are certainly the unfortunate impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we know that people living in pain um, because of the structural vulnerability that many of them already experience um, had further uh, challenges, um, disproportionate challenges um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. There was a lot of isolation. Um, there was decreased options available to them for the management of their pain with all of the closures. They had less contact with their healthcare providers. Um, and we know that many people turned to substances and other coping mechanisms throughout the pandemic. Um, and for people with chronic pain, um, certainly there is a higher risk given that some of them are already using substances to manage their pain or are prescribed opioids to manage their pain. And so this more, more recent article um, by Dr. Gomes and her colleague really point to the fact that we've also seen a surge during the pandemic of opioid related mortality. And so we know that this is closely linked for many of our patients living with chronic pain. Just coming back to um, my patient, Cassandra. Um, so, you know, we had taken a closer look at her opioids and she was experiencing some interdose withdrawal. She also described to me, you know, at the time that I first met her that her menses had stopped and she already had features of wi more widespread pain than she ever had before. Um, she was really fearful of a lot of changes and she really wanted to avoid acute crises at all cost. but we really were working with the hope that her life could be better and we started there. Um, we started to build up her other coping mechanisms for pain, her sleep, um, we tried relaxation, we had suggestions from the team for TENS, um, ICE, and we really tried to explore the activities she enjoyed you know, she worked with our social worker and our nurse, and she really focused her energy into gardening and painting, which she found very therapeutic. I also spent a lot of time with her to give her some education about opioids so that she would understand what options were available to her. Unfortunately, uh, like, like what I just described, during the pandemic, she did become very isolated. She wasn't able to go outside because of her risks of respiratory illness in particular, you know, prior to becoming vaccinated, um, she just felt uncomfortable. And so she really wasn't moving and her pain really skyrocketed. So although we were able to make some changes um, initially, you know, we actually saw her later and she was on an even higher dose of opioids more recently. So when we work, um, with people who are using opioids as clinicians, you know, we really need to always think to be opioid stewards where we try to improve, monitor and evaluate the use of opioids. 
trying to maintain this balance that's absolutely necessary to use them therapeutically to help people who need them, um, but also weigh the risks to both individuals and society. And so, like I mentioned, you know, when I do education with people about how to manage their opioids, there's really not one right way. We try to really individualize it for that person. We try to really understand which of these options would be best. Should we taper to the least effective dose or maybe change their formulation? Um, sometimes we talk about discontinuation, but that's usually a long-term goal and not a short-term goal because we do not do rapid tapers. Instead, we often prefer to switch to alternative opioids because um, opioid switching actually has been found to either have the same or better pain uh, management, and we can often lower the dose in that process. And we often use long-acting morphine, but there are many other options. Um, more recently, like in the last you know, five years, we've started to do a lot of switches to buprenorphine naloxone for pain specifically. We find that um, it has a lot of benefits, in particular, it's long half-life. Um, and so we're really starting to explore that as a good option for more of our patients. And of course, methadone is always also a good option. Uh, for people who are using opioid agonist therapy who have opioid use disorder, we can also take advantage um, in terms of the dosing and the regimens of these agents also to help manage their pain. And then in addition, we try to optimize non-opioid strategies, structure the opioid prescribing and dispensing to reduce the burden to the person who is using opioids and offer naloxone kit and training for safety as well as safe storage and disposal. And then I already highlighted the approach that we often take, but really to individualize the plan, we need to understand you know, how that opioid fits into their life how they view it, you know, what are the upsides and the downsides to their perspective. And then I often, you know, borrow this from motivational interviewing, um, this structure, but I really try to engage them in that type of MI conversation, um, reflect responses and emotions that I hear. And I just have a few sentences here on the slide that I hear myself saying incredibly often. Um, but you know, once we really establish that I'm here to listen to them, to partner with them around a decision for their opioid management plan, um, I really find that that empowers them and we have much more successful outcomes with any changes that we're going to make. Um, anytime that I'm about to give education, we always like to see where the person is at. And so I ask permission, but then also tailor that information. So, as much as there are many wonderful opioid programs out there, I always encourage all of um, uh, well, my students when I, when I lecture in the faculty of pharmacy to really try and use our skills to tailor that information to the person so that they know that we are listening to them and trying to make this work for them. So I'm going to end this presentation with uh, an excellent quote um, that resonates with so many people who have chronic pain by Lady Gaga, who also um, lives with fibromyalgia. And really this quote is talking about the words that we use as healthcare professionals and how we can reduce the stigma that's associated with chronic pain and the use of opioids to really support people um, not necessarily to support people to reduce their pain, but we often try to focus on supporting people to build up their lives so that they um, have more enjoyment and better quality of life. So we try not to think about taking things away, but really what we can add for them. And I just wanted to report most recently um, working with Cassandra and we have taken steps to switch her. She has been able to slowly taper her morphine equivalent. So when I do the calculation, she's gone from roughly 400 milligrams of morphine equivalent to start. And she's come all the way down. She's stabilized now after a few years on um, 120 milligrams of morphine equivalent. Um, we really don't foresee when she will be off of her opioids, but we have considered future steps related to switching to buprenorphine naloxone. Um, so our relationship will continue with her. 
but she certainly feels like this has um, made huge changes to her life and how she experiences it. So she's a real success story in our books, even though she continues on long-term opioid therapy. And I'll just leave with a few key considerations when caring for patients that chronic pain has significant impacts on individuals and society. Um, we know that opioids are only one of the tools to manage chronic pain and we really want to embed that in our management plans. We always want to practice opioid stewardship and use a person-centered motivational approach to opioid management. We wanna promote harm reduction and address stigma associated with chronic pain and opioid use. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we will do questions just following Rosemary's presentation. So if you do have any questions, please keep them um, in mind and then you can type them in the Q&A box afterwards. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Rosemary Wilson. Rosemary is an associate professor in the School of Nursing Department of Anesthesiology at Queen's University and is a nurse practitioner in chronic pain care at Kingston Health Sciences Center. Rosemary has been a nurse for 28 years and an NP since 2000. During this time, she has practiced in a variety of settings, home care, acute care, medicine and surgery, and outpatient specialty care in both Canada and Sub-Saharan Africa. Rosemary is the Associate Director, Graduate Programs in the School of Nursing and the Deputy Director, Practice for Queen, the Queen's Collaboration for Healthcare Quality. Her research centers around acute and chronic pain and spans from pluralist clinically oriented research to knowledge translation and quality improvement. So Rosemary, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Leah. Um... Am I? I hope I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just going to share my screen here and we'll, we'll get going. Um, I'm not going to go over the same. There's some issues, some overlap between Laura's and my talk, which is wonderful because it means that um, in the interprofessional environment, we're all thinking about the same things, um, which is terrific. Um, I do practice at the Kingston Health Sciences Center in interprofessional capacity um, in this um, incredible uh, clinic. Um, and I want to pick up on this notion that we have to practice person-centered care with patients with uh, chronic pain um, and really be cognizant of the fact that folks that come to see us who are on opioids are often feeling quite disenfranchised. Um, and I'm totally going to pick up on that point that Laura highlighted quite uh, so eloquently about uh, these persons having such challenges in their pain care that can be related to policy change to some degree. Um, and also because of the pandemic, um, I know, you know, our, a lot of our care in our clinics um, was lim very limited in our capacity to provide interventional work um, was stopped due to, due to some of the restrictions and some of our colleagues in physiotherapy, OT, social work, psychology, and even the anesthesiologists I work with were redeployed to other areas. Um, and so in some respects, um, you know, I, I can see how prescribing has definitely increased for our patients because unfortunately, um, in some cases, it's all we had open to us at the time. Um, so that is something we have to keep in mind as we uh, emerge from this pandemic. So, you uh, know, in my practice, and, and I think in the practice of, of in many chronic pain clinics across the country, patients come to us often already on opioids. Um, and, and there is a stigma that they've had to deal with that we need to be aware of um, when we're caring for them. Um, and in some cases, uh, uh, primary care providers um, are very reluctant to, uh, to take patients back who are on opioids. So that certainly is a consideration um, when you're caring for them because they feel like they've done a, done a bad thing. The patients feel like they're you know, in a bad place because they're on opioids and nobody wants them. Um, is something that we deal with on a, on a regular basis. However, in the literature, um, although we know that opioids have a place uh, in chronic pain, um, there's not a lot of literature to support the, the safety and efficacy, in, but there is a, some real problem with the literature out there. We practice evidence-based practice. Um, in many of these studies that compare opioids to, to placebo or nothing, um, and some of the important outcomes like function or return to work, um, might be uh, might be missing 
Um, so in and as Laura pointed out, in lots of cases, some the patients that we see who come to us on opioids may not have had uh, other other non opioid medications or other treatments um, prescribed to them previously. So, um, but to say that opioids don't play a role in in effective chronic pain would be incorrect. Uh, so I want to put that out there. So there's not much consensus um, around researchers about this idea of uh, opiate-induced hyperalgesia. We do know that it exists. It's, it's really, really important. Um, and we've proven that it exists in an um, empirical way, in a research way. Um, but we don't really know which of our patients actually have opiate-induced hyperalgesia. And what it is, is it's where patients have an increased sensitivity to pain that is caused by some of the effects of the opioids um, uh, in the spinal cord and in the, in the, at the receptor level. So there's some sensitivity, uh, extra sensitivity, in addition to the, all, all the other sort of um, adverse effects that Laura mentioned before. Um, so this idea that, that sometimes the high doses of opioids that our patients are on can be contributing to um, their pain. Uh, and if you're interested in that topic, I would suggest um, having a read of this article because it's particularly good. Um, other things we have to consider, as Laura mentioned before, tolerance and dependence are, are part of the paradigm when patients are on opioids. Um, and there are always risks of these systemic effects that Laura mentioned, um, in addition to withdrawal and overdose, um, and then addiction. And one of the interesting things um, that we find in practice is that our patients will persist in the use of opioids um, and, and persist in continuing to advocate for themselves to continue opioids, despite understanding of what these risks are. Um, and despite understanding of the developments of, of tolerance and, and uh, um, opiate-induced hyperalgesia and misuse. Um, because I think in, in some, some cases they do establish or they have established some small benefit or some minute change in, or a, a, maybe even a good change in particular situations um, in their pain care or their, their, their uh, attitude towards their pain with the use of opioids. So Laura introduced this, the Canadian National Guideline for Opioids in Context of Chronic Non-Cancer Pain. And I can't stress enough how important this guideline is for us. Um, this new um, module resource uh, that you have access to really goes through some of the, the history of, of opioids. And there's lots of literature out there that explains um, really what's happened in the opiate prescribing landscape. Um, but in 2017, when this, this guideline was updated, um, they did, uh, as Laura mentioned, um, come to the consensus that uh, 90 milligrams of oral morphine equivalents per day is what was considered to be a watchful dose um, and in the recommendations. And um, I think this is having an impact. And one of the wonderful things about this guideline is it gives you the strength of evidence, as Laura mentioned. Um, and there are lots of, of related um, resources there, as you can see on the right side of your screen, um, that, that are related to particular uh, pain syndromes or situations as well. Um, and I would encourage you to have a look at this as well as uh, reviewing um, the modules that are uh, um, in this resource. And I think it's important to note that um, for all practitioners that are looking after um, patients with chronic pain um, who are on opioids um, in, in particular, uh, and especially nurses, um, it's important to do a good biopsychosocial assessment um, and reassessment. And it's important to use scales and assessment tools and to conduct screening. So the biopsychosocial model um, of pain uh, is was something that Laura mentioned in her section of the talk. Um, but I think the biopsychosocial model of illness is appropriate um, as well, as we really should be assessing how uh, our patients who are on opioids are engaging in social context their participation, um, the stages of where they are in terms of their stages of illness in their life and their quality of life and 
um, is quite a very, a very person-centered approach. Um, and I love the mind movement medication, Laura, that was great. And I would add treatments because the treatments are so important um, that we provide that may not be uh, necessarily um, uh, medication-based. So in that assessment, um, it's incredibly important to do a comprehensive health history um, make sure that you understand every aspect of what the patient has, in person has experienced. Um, do a best possible medication history and then rec if possible. And I know my pharmacy colleagues would uh, um, are probably jumping up and down saying, "Hooray, that needs to happen." Um, and med reconciliation is so important um, because oftentimes uh, these individual individuals are on a large number of medications, and we know that more than five medications leads. Um, people to a higher risk of uh, medication-related uh, adverse effects um, or errors. It's important to have a look at their diet, their fluid intake, their exercise, their sleep. Um, we need to be alert for uh, side uh, adverse effects of opioids if they're on their relationships as well, um, because all of that impacts what they need for uh, for pain. It impacts their their um, engagement with the care that you're going to provide um, as well as follow up and it's important to see who their supportive structures are within their lives. Um, a focused physical assessment is really important um, to make sure you know falls risks and um, other sort of risks to their safety uh, are important to consider as well um, and an establishment in that assessment of what goals of care what are they hoping to get out of uh, engaging with you in, in chronic pain um, and what are they hoping to get out of medication management with respect to opioids specifically? I'm a big advocate for the impact re recommendations. So um, impact recommendations lay out way back in 2003, 2005, and I believe they've been updated since um, to use some of these sort of common scales um, because it, it contributes to a, a common language that we can all speak in the collaborative environment. Um, we know that a, a, a particular score on a, on a, a scale that's commonly used uh, means something specific. So just an example of, of one of those uh, scales that looks at function. Um, the short form brief pain inventory we use quite frequently in our practice. And I think this is pretty ubiquitous um, out there in the clinical environments. The um, education resource provides some really good uh, screening information in module three, uh, but we need to screen for, uh, for mental health um, disorders, suicidality, um, for a substance misuse, um, important to screen for safety as well. And um, safety is important, um, not just for falls, for risk, but for um, safety in environments, particularly if they have prescriptions for opioids. Are they safe to have them? Are they stored safely? Um, are they in a, Are they disposed of safely if uh, patients are on um, patches, uh, perhaps buprenorphine or fentanyl patches? Um, those are, are things that uh, we know to be problematic for patient and family safety. Um, and I have seen patients in my clinical practice who have been at physical, physical risk and because of their living environment, um, because they're known, known in the, their environment to have um, had legitimate prescriptions for, for uh, opioids uh, for chronic pain relief. Um, that structured follow-up is really, really important as well um, for, uh, uh, for screening, just to continue to uh, um, screen, just because somebody has screened low risk on an initial um, prescribing of opioids doesn't mean that they continue to be low risk as time goes by. So um, in using a person-centered approach to screen uh, and to explain to um, to a persons that that uh, we have to screen um, ongoing for their own safety um, is important. Goals of care um, is are one of those things that can be quite. It's an important conversation to have. Um, I found this really interesting and graphic to show you. It's a it's a tiny bit confusing, but um, if you look at the difference between the physicians and the patients in this uh, in this interesting study, um, what this says is the physicians here are, are really focused on function in terms of the goal, goals of care, and, and the uh, the patients are are um, focused on reducing intensity and finding a reason why they have pain um, as their first priority. 
So, and I, I think uh, to add to what Laura said also, our priority is an interdisciplinary collaborative, um, regardless of where we're practicing is, is should, should be to focus on functional goals um, and balance that with, with adverse effects for the types of care um, we provide, not just providing opioids, but some of the other non-opioid non, uh, non medications um, as well. But uh, um, I think that uh, convincing patients to, to look at functional goals and, and negotiating them with them in advance about uh, what those functional goals will look like, um, what's important to them, how, what does success look like for them um, really does help uh, in the, the trial, in trials of opioids, in the process of, of uh, tapering opioids where it's appropriate, and, and even maintenance. Um, those difficult conversations that Laura was talking about um, really are, are uh, part of, part of that, establishing that in advance um, with patients, if you can, uh, before we even start opioids. So everybody knows where what success looks like. Safety and risk is so important um, with our with our uh, individuals who are on opioids. Um, opioid contracting is absolutely necessary, um, and that's a opioid contracts. For those of you who maybe are not aware, are a, a contract between an individual and a provider um, that they will receive. Uh, opioids and uh, other select medications only from that provider, only from a particular pharmacy. Um, and that's a contract between, between you that sets out the, um, the consequences if that contract is broken. And it's, it's an um, important key. It's a, it's a key tool in, in clinical practice. I talked earlier about um, home assessment, uh, making sure our, our persons are safe um, and that their home environments are safe, that things are being um, stored safely and, and uh, establishing risk of falls and other uh, issues related to, um, um, to their safety in the environment, um, making sure they've got support uh, and, uh, um, and can get uh, access to, to have conversations with you either on the telephone to telehealth or to come into clinic and where that's appropriate. Uh, monitoring and follow-up is key. Uh, in safety and risk, um, monitoring your patients on opioids, uh, having writing a prescription, and then or uh, having a patient on a prescription that you're caring for as a collaborative, and not seeing them for a long period of time uh, um, is not a, is not advised, and we need to follow up frequently. And scrupulous documentation is a, is very very important uh, when you have pa patients on opioids. Um, it's important to document each prescription to make sure that that um, patients are using their their medications as prescribed. Um, there is no there's the issues of, of early requests for early releases or maybe late releases, which puts uh, put puts patients at the risk for withdrawal uh, who are on opioids. So these are all things we have to consider. Um, and then finally, uh, person centered education about things like naloxone, as Laura mentioned, and um, and safety and uh, appropriate use of medications um, and other medications and things that they can um, engage in, like having conversations about uh, having a beer uh, alongside having opioids or um, maybe smoking cannabis or uh, other things uh, or vaping. Um, these are things that need to be part of that person-centered education uh, to reduce the stigma of some of those other activities so that you are aware of them um, and your, the people that you're caring for are, are aware of the risk. Um, and lastly, communication is so important. So communication with, with uh, um, our persons that we're caring for, uh, as well as all the collaborative team and their family, you know, caregivers and supports. Uh, we need to be consistent. We have, need to have frequent uh, uh, communication. Um, and we need to be comprehensive. Uh, I put a telephone there because whenever I write as an NP a prescription for opioids, I, for the first time, I pick up the phone and I call the pharmacist um, where, uh, where the patient's medications are being dispensed. So they're aware of, of exactly what the um, individual will be getting um, and what our plans are for dispensing um, and uh, monitoring. Um, and that 
a telephone call um, is worth its weight in gold, uh, believe me. So I'm going to stop there because I think we're pretty short on time. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Great. Thank you, Rosemary. And thank you, Laura, as well. So we do have a little bit of time now uh, to, to allow for some questions. So please feel free to um, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Or if you don't see that, you can just type it in the chat. And um, I think Laura and Rosemary would be happy to answer those for you. No questions? One of the wonderful things about having access to a clinical pharmacist is that um, you get all that good collaboration. Um, having having our uh, the people that we care for having access to a pharmacist would be wonderful. I'm very envious of your clinic, Laura. Thanks. That's a huge vote of confidence. Um, definitely, you know, we've seen our referrals shift over the years and our, our roles shift. Uh, originally, I was only seeing people who, you know, were struggling with either high dose opioids, um, but definitely there's a, a growing role for, as you mentioned, you know, the communication with the community pharmacists, ensuring that we maintain structured opioid prescribing. Um, I do a lot of um, consults with family physicians and, community pharmacies um, just to describe our management plan um, and talk about you know, how we might do a taper a rotation, what the long-term plan is so that they can be included in that too and provide consistent education. Um, so I really love how you frame the interprofessional team as not only being you know, within the clinic, but also um, to enable good transitions in care. I'm gonna look for opportunities to do that more, I think. I do find I, you know, I, I often tell um, the persons that I'm looking after that, you know, I'm going to be in communication with your, the pharmacist at your, at your, uh, where you have your medications dispensed and we'll talk about dispensing intervals and we'll talk about how best to communicate and I'll let them know what day I'm in clinic and it really it's, uh, it's been great for um, our patient population and it's been, I think it's been lovely to meet virtually and over the phone, the pharmacist, because um, then they were, I'm not just a signature, which is wonderful. Yeah, I think it helps our patients too, like you said, um, you know, and I mentioned like decreasing the burden for them, but it helps any anxiety right around their refills. And, you know, they can't get a hold of us as prescribers or they can't, um, you know, something's on back order maybe in the pharmacy. So um, I think communication is key to decrease that burden. I see we have a question. Exciting. <laughs> oh, what would you suggest to a patient's tried everything, including opioids to risk? <laughs> well, uh, who have tried everything, I would wanna know whether they've tried everything all at once. Um, so I think, you know, in the biopsychosocial model, you've got you know, you want to use uh, um, your CBT and mindfulness and um, self-management and non other non-pharmacologic um, therapies, PT, OT, um, good diet, all of that stuff. Um, in addition to, in addition to medications. You know, I would add, just borrowing from your talk, Rosemary, you know, for, for many people who come and say they've tried absolutely everything, there's nothing left to try. Um, the hundreds of patients I've seen over the years, that's, that's actually not, not the case. But I, um, I think revisiting goals of therapy, like the words that you've used here, relieve their chronic pain, I think really setting realistic goals with them is where we start. Um, like you just mentioned, reviewing their trials, like what how long were they? Why, why did things not work out? You know, sometimes what we find is when people were on really high doses of opioids, other things failed. 
but it's because I didn't give them the same type of feeling or relief. It, it offered a different um, type of benefit for their pain. And so retrying them after they've maybe cut down or stopped their opioids have is often much more effective. And, you know, in the case of medications where people have feel like they've tried everything and not tolerate it and they're just exhausted, we're actually starting to use pharmacogenomic testing for some of these um, uh, people um, who were able to connect them with the right test, um, you know, that they can either afford or that we can um, use under research. And sometimes that gives them just that little bit of information, but also hope that we're like targeting more to them, not just trial and error, a little bit therapeutic test. And that's really interesting. In, in pharmacogenomics, gen, certain medications don't work for indiv some individuals for some genetic reasons, right? That's right. Either sometimes people don't process um, the drug to its active form, or sometimes, you know, they may have experienced adverse effects because they don't metabolize it or process it to its inactive form. Um, so there are some very extensive reports out there. Uh, I think it's right now tough on the user because they're really just emerging in terms of the links with clinical um, advice. But like I said, I think it's going to be a new area that we'll all be working on in the next decade. Excellent. I'm so happy to see that coming. That's great. Thank you. Um, I don't see any further questions. And so I think we will uh, wrap up there. I just want to thank our presenters and all of our speakers again, and uh, everyone for coming today. I will follow up with a short survey. So uh, please consider filling that out and um, have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.